controversial plans to allow extradition to the Chinese mainland. The demonstrators are calling for the proposals to be completely withdrawn and for Mrs Lam to resign. Well, our China correspondent Stephen McDonnell is at the protest with the latest. Hong Kong's streets are again a sea of protest. A day after the government here was forced into a humiliating backdown. It's delayed a bill to allow for people to be sent to mainland Chinese courts, where demonstrators say a free trial is not possible. But those marching are demanding more. They want the plan scrapped altogether. Basically, we shouldn't let the government have all power to us yeah. because we have our own freedom of rights and yeah. freedom of speech. And this is why we're out here. So if the bill passed, like Hong Kong, we have no democracy anymore. This is not acceptable. That's why I feel I come today. And also my parents have come here today. All, of, all my friends are coming here today. I, because I'm really, really upset about this. If this happened, Hong Kong maybe is over. Many in the crowd have blamed Hong Kong's leader, Carrie Lam, for instigating this crisis. They say the chief executive pushed ahead with extradition in the face of clear mass opposition. Now they want something else from her. The death of a protester last night contributed to a sombre mood. He'd fallen from a building. People wore ribbons and carried flowers in his memory. If the idea was to take the steam out of the protest movement by delaying this bill, as you can see, it hasn't exactly worked. The other people who'd be watching this are the Politburo Standing Committee in Beijing. These are all Chinese citizens, and this is a clear act of defiance from people who are saying that any attempt to erode their freedoms will be resisted in the streets. There's a renewed belief in the power of protest here, and as long as the threat of extradition remains, a large proportion of the population seem prepared to mobilise in order to stop it. Stephen MacDonald, BBC News, Hong Kong. Five of the six Conservative Party leadership candidates are preparing to go head-to-head -head in their first televised debate tonight. However, Boris Johnson, the front-runner in the race, will not be taking part. The Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, has said that choosing Mr Johnson as the next Tory leader would mean Britain leaving the European Union without a deal. Our political correspondent, Nick Eardley, reports. Catch him if you can. Boris Johnson is the front-runner to be our next PM, and he's still keeping his head down. He won't be at the first TV debate tonight, but his rivals know he's the man to catch. Jeremy Hunt thinks he can make up the ground, but unlike Mr Johnson, he's not promising Brexit will be done by the end of October. This morning, he wouldn't even commit to definitely leaving this year. Why? Because he wants a new deal and believes Europe could be open to it. They say that if they were approached by a British Prime Minister, someone they were willing to deal with, uh, who uh, had ideas as to how to solve the Northern Irish border, they would be willing to renegotiate the package. The problem? Time and time again, Europe has ruled out reopening the withdrawal agreement. And some Tories fear this could go on and on and on. When people voted, they voted to leave. We haven't left yet, and that's why we're seeing uh, not just the uncertainty for the economy and the damage it's doing to businesses. Many of whom come to me and say, we just want to know what you're doing. But also this corrosion of public trust. And it is uh, the Tory party will be toast unless we're out by the end of October. Dominic Raab questioned Boris Johnson's Brexit plan, and others have too, like Rory Stewart, the unlikely celebrity of the leadership race. He says he wouldn't serve in a Johnson government and believes his Brexit strategy doesn't stand up to serious scrutiny. Because nobody has yet had the chance to question him. And as soon as you question him, as soon as I sit down with him and ask the big question, how? How are you going to deliver Brexit? How are you going to get a no deal through? Then it begins to come off the rails. There is a clear front-runner in the race to call this place home, but Boris Johnson's rivals insist there's a long way to go. Tonight, without him, they'll take part in the first TV debate, hoping they can do something to stop this leadership contest becoming a foregone conclusion. Nick Early, BBC News. Two teenagers have been charged with the murder of an 18-year-old man who was stabbed to death at Wandsworth in South London on Friday. Scotland Yard said 18-year-old Mohamed Nadir Dafala and a 17-year-old boy had been charged.
A huge electrical power failure is affecting large parts of Latin America. Some reports suggest that almost all of Argentina and Uruguay are without mains electricity. Parts of Brazil and Paraguay are also said to be affected. After severe flooding in Lincolnshire, emergency services there say they are worried about the prospect of more heavy rainfall this week, with storms forecast in the coming days. Hundreds of people have already been forced to leave their homes at Waynefleet and Thorpe Culvert after the river steeping burst its banks. Well, our correspondent Lakshmi Gopal is there for us uh, with the latest. Lakshmi, uh, just uh, tell us what's happening there and how worried are the emergency services of what's What's uh, coming round the corner? Well, Ben, it might seem clear and fine at the moment, or relatively speaking, but until just a couple of minutes ago, it was lashing down with rain. And as you say, there's more heavy rain expected over the next few days. So you can see why people here are really worried about yet more flooding. Behind me is the pumping station, which was vital to the efforts to minimise the risk of further flooding. But that too has been flooded and emergency teams have been working desperately to try to keep it going and they have succeeded in that and kept the vital parts clear so it's still working. The Environment Agency has brought in high volume pumps to help channel away some of that water. They're worried about the river steeping breaching its banks again as it did on Wednesday at points where the flood defences are weak and vulnerable. And that's why yesterday the RAF Chinook returned to drop bags of sand and gravel on those points to, to try to shore up the defences. And that has held up for now, but they're clear that we're not out of the danger zone yet, which is why the residents from 600 homes that have been evacuated are still not able to return because they've been told it's just not safe yet. OK, thank you, Luxme. Luxme Gopal reporting. Now, it is one of the world's most intense sporting rivalries and it takes centre stage today as India take on Pakistan at the Cricket World Cup. India are un unbeaten so far in the tournament and they are currently charging ahead against Pakistan as our sports correspondent Andy Swiss reports now for us from Old Trafford. If you wonder just what this game means, well, here's your answer. For India and Pakistan fans, all roads led to Manchester. Whatever their transport, they just had to be there. This means a lot for us. We are from India only to watch the match. Only to, India win, the match. to win the match. It's more than a cricket match. This is war. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's the biggest match in the world. Any sporting can't beat it. The best part of a million oh, fans had applied for tickets, lovely. with an estimated Outside. billion watching on TV. Talk about air. pressure. But it was India's batsman that rose to the occasion, oh, Rohit Sharma setting a blistering tone, the favourites off to a flyer. Pakistan had never beaten India at a World Cup and their early prospects didn't look encouraging as India raced past 100. But finally, a breakthrough. KL Rahul out for 57. At last, something for the Pakistan fans to cheer. It was India, though, still very much in the driving seat. Rohit Sharma completing a stunning century to delight of his jubilant supporters. Still a long way to go, but this greatest of sporting rivalries has so far been largely one-sided. Well, the very latest I can tell you is that India are still going very nicely indeed. They're currently 234 for two and on course for a huge total. Pakistan, remember, have won only one of their four games so far in this tournament. They really have to win this to get their World Cup hopes back on track. But it looks like they're going to need something very special indeed, Ben. All right, Andy, thank you very much. Andy Swiss there at Old Trafford. Tyson Fury put on an impressive show for the American boxing public as he beat previously undefeated heavyweight Tom Schwartz in Las Vegas. Fury dominated from the start and stopped the German fighter in the second round with his opponent's corner throwing in the towel. Well, you can see more on all of today's stories on the BBC News Channel. The next news on BBC One is at 25 to 7. Goodbye for now. Well, you're watching the BBC News Channel with me, Ben Brown, and the time is exactly ten minutes past one.
Iran has complained to Britain's ambassador in the country after the UK government accused it of involvement in the attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman, something the Iranian authorities have strongly denied. Well, amid the growing tensions, the British-Iranian woman jailed in Tehran for spying, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, has now started a new hunger strike. She denies any wrongdoing. Simon Jones has the latest. Outside the Iranian embassy in London, a lone tent, symbolising the growing tensions between the UK and Tehran. The husband of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe camping outside the building to try to make his voice heard. His wife remains in jail following her arrest at Tehran airport after visiting her family three years ago, accused of being a spy, which she's always denied. Well, with camping out in solidarity with Nazanin, she's gone on hunger strike in uh, Iran in prison. You can't see that. Said that if she was going to do it, we'd go on hunger strike here. And obviously you can see me, um, and we're doing it in front of the Iranian embassy, just that all the time she's going through it, that, that we'll go through it with her. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe's case is intricately connected with the difficult relationship between the UK and Iran, which has just become even more tense. London has accused Tehran of being behind attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman, one of the world's busiest waterways. Iran says that's not true. It made its displeasure known at a meeting with Britain's ambassador. The Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, who met Richard Ratcliffe yesterday, has urged Iran to put any differences aside and show compassion to Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe to allow her to return home to her family. For her husband and their supporters, the wait continues, with no response yet to the protests from the Iranian authorities. Simon Jones, BBC News. Well, I've been discussing the crisis in Iran at the moment with uh, Nazanin Ansari. She's an Iranian-British journalist and editor of Cayenne London, which provides news for a global Iranian community. We have been in a confrontation for a very long time, whether it be economic, uh, cyber, uh, through social media, uh, through the uh, airwaves, news media. But at the moment, what is really, really getting uh, dangerous is the military confrontation. And what we have seen in the past uh, 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 years and also specifically in the past uh, few months, uh, the uh, the statements, the behavior uh, of the Islamic Republic has become uh, ever more aggressive. And um, indeed, uh, they have been uh, issuing statement after statement, uh, explaining their presence uh, all time 24-7 uh, in the Persian Gulf area to, uh, to make sure that uh, the waterways are open. But now, we understand that when the two tankers gave out their first signals of distress um, and uh, an American drone went to find out what is going on, it was shot at. So um, war and confrontation in a physical sense is all to the advantage, and this is what uh, the Islamic Republic wants and the leaders really have given up because at the end of their 40-year uh, reign, uh, it has been a failure, and whether they can really uh, be able to reform the infrastructure of the state uh, to make uh, Iran into to start uh, providing the necessary means for to, the, to its people, and also become a really positive force on the international scale, an active force in the international scale, uh, it cannot. Nazanin Ansari, there, a uh, British Iranian journalist. President Trump has again taken to Twitter to criticise the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. He retweeted a post from the right-wing commentator Katie Hopkins and he said, quote, London needs a new mayor, ASAP. Khan is a disaster, will only get worse. And he later followed that up with another tweet saying, he is a national disgrace who is destroying the city of London. The president comments came uh, after five attacks in London in less than 24 hours, which left three men dead and three others injured. Well, I've been discussing the president's latest tweets with the political scientist Dr Brian Klaas, who talked to me about the effect of Donald Trump's controversial social media comments. I mean, Trump and Sadiq Khan have had a Twitter spat back and forth for some time now. Um, I think what's notable about this tweet in particular is that Trump is amplifying Katie Hopkins, who is viewed, I think, rightly in this country as quite an extreme far-right figure. Um, and the tweet that he retweeted 
had serious anti-Muslim bigotry embedded into it. So it's another one of these long-standing feuds that's layered on top of Trump's long-standing animosity and I would say bigotry towards Muslim communities. Um, and Trump has made part of his platform being anti-Muslim bigotry. I mean, I think one thing we forget sometimes is that in December of 2015, Trump literally said that we should ban all Muslims from entering the United States. I mean, it's an extremely uh, far-right position to have. And so this foil of Sadiq Khan is useful for him politically as he heads into the 2020 election campaign. But I also think it's important that we, we, we don't lose sight of how unusual and unacceptable it is to mainstream these comments. I mean, Katie Hopkins is somebody who has compared migrants to cockroaches. She has used dehumanizing language. And for the president of the United States to again retweet one of these figures, previously he retweeted Jada Franson, who's a leader of Britain First, a Islamophobic hate group here. You know, it's a very dangerous territory to wade into. Dr. Brian Class, a surgeon who served time in prison for killing a patient before his conviction was quashed, has raised concerns about the way black and ethnic minority doctors are treated by the professional regulator. Figures obtained by the BBC suggest the General Medical Council is more likely to investigate complaints against black and Asian doctors than those who are white. Here's Amara Sophia Elahi. I'd lost my salary, I'd lost my reputation, I lost my job. David Selyu is a respected colorectal surgeon with over 40 years of medical experience in the NHS and private sector. In 2010, a patient died under his care. He was investigated by the GMC, then charged and convicted of gross negligence manslaughter. He was later cleared on appeal after serving 15 months of a two-year prison sentence. Mr. Selyu believes his race played a part in the way his case and others have been handled. The General Medical Council, which is our regulator, uh, investigates a disproportionate number of black and ethnic minority doctors. We should all proportionately take the blame for when things go wrong, and things do go wrong in medicine, after all. Black and Asian doctors make up around a third of the workforce in the UK, yet they're overrepresented in fitness to practice cases. Figures obtained by the BBC show that over a five year period, 44% of complaints made against black doctors led to investigations. For Asian doctors, it was 40%, and for white doctors, it was just 29%. They also revealed 12% of black doctors were suspended or erased from the medical register after an investigation by the Medical Practitioners Tribunal Service. That's more than double the proportion of white doctors. The GMC said it's not complacent about its own processes being free from discrimination, which is why it regularly and independently gets them reviewed. It's commissioned research to understand better why black and Asian doctors are disproportionately complained about, investigated and sanctioned. They destroyed my profession, they destroyed my career. Somebody surely should have been held to account for that. But no, nobody, I didn't get any apology. Uh, nothing. Amara Sophia Alahi, BBC News. On Father's Day three years ago, Andrew Sutty discovered he was going to be a father, but one of his twin daughters was then born with a rare disorder and, and died at just eight months old. Well, the charity that helped Andrew and his family say 16,000 Scottish children have a life shortening illness. And now an appeal has been launched to try to ensure there is support for fathers like Andrew. Louise Cowie has been to meet him. So it was Father's Day 2016. Jack and I have been trying uh, for a while to have a baby and we'd had IVF and it was the first, first kind of round of IVF and Jack came on Father's Day and said, you're going to be a dad, so we're obviously absolutely delighted. A month or so afterwards, we found out that it was going to be twins, so we're obviously delighted with that as well. In 32 weeks, the girls were born um, by C-section, and Jess was tiny, she was £2.11. Um, both George and Jessica needed uh, intensive care in the neonatal unit, um, and then obviously Jessica was in for three months and Georgia was in for three weeks. About a week after or so uh, of our discharge, we found out that it was this Zellweger syndrome, and that was just obviously just catastrophic. It's just a horrible, horrible thing to go through and, and finding out at that stage that your child's not going to live to their first birthday and all the, the hopes that you had for that child are just absolutely shattered. It was, it was awful. I 
researched the kind of different support groups and whatnot, and I, I asked if we could be referred to Chaz. They accepted us um, to go to Rachel House. It's a children's hospice, but you would, you know, you wouldn't know that. It, it's it's like a five-star hotel. There's all different families there at the same time, obviously, and every single one of them has a child that has a life-shortening condition. So, being somebody that maybe didn't open up about my emotions in the past. There's other dads there that are probably exactly in the same boat, like most Scottish males are, they just don't express their emotions. So it was good to be able to just talk quite openly with them about how you're feeling. George and Jessica had been sharing a room together, having, having we um, babble away to each other. And then Jacqueline knew that something wasn't right with Jessica and then she just stopped breathing and it just, it was out, it really was out of the blue, even though you know what to expect that. It was just came as such a shock. Georgia, why don't you sing a song to Jessica? Mm -hmm. He's here. Right from the start with, with George, our sister, we will always speak about Jessica. Um, if any of my friends, you know, I think they maybe feel a bit apprehensive about speaking about Jessica, but I love speaking about her. She was my daughter and she always will be my daughter. Are your overriding memories of her? Her beautiful smile. Um, uh, sorry. Just her relationship with Georgia. She was just, they, they loved each other, you know, they looked at each other. They definitely knew they were sisters, and yeah. It was, I'll always remember her smile and her chat, and she just chatted non stop all the time. You're watching BBC News. The time is 21 minutes past one exactly. The four times Tour de France champion Chris Froome says he's lucky to be here after suffering serious injuries after a crash while he was training in France. The cyclist has posted this photo on social media with the words, On the road to recovery, after undergoing several hours of surgery. In a statement, Chris Froome said he is fully focused on getting...